This is Andy Poroff, Boxing Social, in association with Betfred. And once again, <laughs> I'm joined by Eddie Hearn. This time in Cardiff. Eddie, how are you doing? I'm all right, mate. The travelling salesman continues. <laughs> I was laughing at myself this morning because I was just... I got the train to uh, Liverpool Street, then I got the, the uh, tube to Paddington. And I was running for the train to, from Paddington to Cardiff. And I was just laughing at myself because I was thinking, if anyone saw me now, just this big fat dollop running through the through the uh, concourse trying to get to my train. It's the life we lead, mate. It's the life we lead. Another day on the graph, another day on the grind. Eddie Hearn gets a tube. Of course I get a tube. People say that to me when I'm on a tube. What are you doing on a tube? So like if I've got a car from Liverpool Street to Paddington, it'll take me double the time. <laughs> now, one thing I did just notice is you did a little shoulder bump with yeah. uh, John Dock. Is that is that what the, the protocol is now ahead of all this coronavirus talk? Or? It's more just, I don't know. <laughs> I think now you go up and shake people's hands, they're like, oh, a couple of people are giving me the old, you know, the foot one as well. Uh, it's an it's a interesting time, especially being involved with live events. You know, um, seen a lot of territories cancel live events. Italy has affected us because we've lost two shows there that we're going to have to reschedule. So, you know, we're all systems go here. Our team were at a government meeting yesterday to talk about the coronavirus and to talk about the procedures and... Um, the precautions and also the potential of, I guess, at some point looking at if they cancel large events, etc. Uh, it doesn't seem imminent by the sounds of things, but, you know, I guess it depends on how bad things get. And uh, it's concerning times for event promoters because it's going to cause a big shake-up. Obviously, we've seen it in football, you know, there's talks about the possible fans not being able to go to fo- uh, the to the games and playing beyond closed doors what kind of consequences do you think we'll have in boxing I know that we won't have that in boxing because of how important yeah. the gate ticket uh, the money purchase made from that is yeah, but what do you expect not, from it's not even just the gate revenue it's the atmosphere that's generated especially in that specific sport you can't have a fight with just the TV crew in the audience because that's you know that crowd that energises the performance that can take you to that peak that moment moment of glory you you imagine you've got a guy fighting for the world title, you know. When you imagine Usyk against Chisora, right? And, and you know, they're battling away and Chisora lands one on Usyk, goes down, he's out, and Chisora sort of gets on the, the turnbuckle. Do you know what I mean? And then, like, there's no one there. It just don't work. So we're hoping, listen, we hope that for the, the country's sake that we control this uh, virus and everything proceeds as normal but obviously there's going to have to be precautions that everybody's going to have to take you don't really know do you we're just we're the man on the street we don't know the truth do we is it being blown out of proportion is it being kept under wraps you know is it not as bad as people say it is or is it that the stats they're saying it's only this many out of this many and flu's common flu's much worse who knows we're all Eddie have you, have you been stockpiling your loo roll then no no you know my missus well, my, this, but this is the madness of it this is why the panic starts my missus goes out oh I bought a month's worth of food today it's all in the freezer I said <laughs> what for well just in case there's a total lockdown of everything I said like your shops will be open you like I mean this is the problem that this pandemic or what you want to call it causes is panic do you know what I mean and it's I get, but we don't know the truth. We're always going to be lied to about this kind of stuff anyway. So we'll have to see. And we get on with business as normal. Um, everybody wants to come and watch live boxing. Everyone wants to come and watch live football. It doesn't matter. So from that, we're going to keep filling the arenas until we're told we can't do live events, which personally, I don't think will happen. You've got to be careful when you shut things down. and just I mean, Italy, but you look at the numbers in Italy, they're out of control. The numbers here are nothing at the moment, but we've got to, you know, so keep washing your hands. I'm washing my hands more than ever. I love it when people say, oh, I've started washing my hands when I go to the <laughs> toilet. It's like, mate, did you not wash your hands when you went to the toilet? So, yeah, that's the corona chat anyway. I said, let's move on from the yeah. coronavirus chat and on to the boxing. You just mentioned, obviously, in fact, you just mentioned Italy there, just very briefly. I bumped into Cali Foy yesterday yeah. whilst I was out getting some food. I just talked about Gamal. Obviously, Gamal yeah. was going to yeah, be out yeah. in Italy. Fighting for a European title. Is there any chance we could see maybe move to one of the British shows? I know you've got the March yeah. 28th card, which is the day after yeah. the Italy yeah. show. It's unlikely to be on that card, but we're going to have to reschedule. I mean, Gamalia fire is one of the most unluckiest fighters I've ever met. You know, busted, the, well, ripped, ripped his bicep in one arm, then ripped his bicep in the other arm, you know, then finally gets his European title shot and the coronavirus keeps him out. So, um, 
we're going to be looking to try and stage him on one of those cards as soon as possible. And we've spoken. I think a lot of people right now, going back to the coronavirus, it's going to be quite interesting because Poland announced today that they're limiting uh, sporting events to a thousand people. So there's quite a few shows in Poland being cancelled. So now there's shows in Italy being cancelled. Apparently Germany might do the same as well. So you're going to get all these fighters. But I've already had calls from Polish promoters today saying, can we put these fights on your card? Oh, we haven't got space, so the answer's no. But it's going to be interesting because fighters from those countries are going to start being without opportunities. Without opportunities to fight, without opportunities to earn money and provide for their family. So that it's going to be interesting. And Gamal... You know, we spoke to the uh, Italian team. They're up for uh, making that fight in the UK or wherever it's going to be. Because in Italy, we just don't know. You know, we don't know how long it's going to take before all is resumed to normal. So, yeah, looking to make sure we get Gamal on one of those cards coming up. Let's move on to this card. The reason we're in Wales, Eddie. Obviously, your first return to a, not necessarily a smaller hall show, but obviously we've been used to seeing AJ fight at the Millennium Stadium recently and now we're returning to Motor Point Arena. Talk about Lee Salby, the IBF final eliminator. Talk about his fight. Well, it's a great fight. I mean, like you said, first time back in the uh, Cardiff International Arena. It's a 5,000 seater, great arena. Um, six years, I think, since we were here last time with Lee Selby. I believe Anthony Joshua boxed on that card as well against Dorian Darch. <laughs> and then obviously back in Cardiff uh, for Joseph Parker and for Carlos Takam. Parker was 2019. No, 18. Uh, so, you know, that was a long time ago. And it's great to be back here. Great network of fight fans in Cardiff who are excited to see televised boxing back. When you look at the card, Lee Selby against Cambosis Jr. is a brilliant fight. Go and watch George Cambosis Jr. You know, he's with Lou DeBella. He's with the team out there. Probably one of the top emerging Australians at the moment. Undefeated, all action, fast paced, can punch. And this is the final eliminator for the IBF world title. So for Lee Selby, moving up from featherweight um, after winning a world title at featherweight, moves two divisions, he wins this fight. He'll be the mandatory for the winner of Lomachenko against Tiafimo Lopez. We would expect that mandatory probably to vacate, but we'll have to see. It's a brilliant, brilliant fight. The main event uh, on the undercard, you've got Joe Caldina, who for me is probably one of the best young talents in world boxing. I watched this kid box years ago at York Hall in one of the Tri-Nation events as an amateur and I just thought this kid is he could be the one to go on. He's been faultless as a professional. I don't think he's probably got maybe the accolades that he deserves so far for his performances. Obviously won the British lightweight title, Commonwealth lightweight title, moves down to Super Feather. Great performance against Tinoco last time out in Monaco. We will announce his opponent this week. You'd be surprised at the level that we're looking. Because I really believe he can fight for a world title this year. So this next fight's got to be a kind of top 15 guy that's going to move him towards those levels. Um, Gavin Gwynn against James Tennyson for the vacant British title. <laughs> oh, <laughs> come on, Ed. Uh, have you got any hand sanitizer? I feel great. Um, for the British title, which is a great, great fight. We saw Gavin Gwynn give Joe Caldina a great fight. Tennyson is non-stop. I think a real problem for any lightweights out there. Chris Billam Smith against Wales' Nathan Forley for the Cruiserweight Commonwealth title. I think Billam Smith is one of those emerging young talents. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, Sean McGoldrick, John Doherty, uh, Jamie Cox returns to the card as well. So, really, really strong card in Wales on uh, May the 9th. Two people I just want to pick up on there. Obviously, you mentioned Chris Billam Smith. I know you were looking at possibly doing a card in Bournemouth. Where did everything kind of land in the end? So, we couldn't get an opponent. Yeah, I really wanted to do a next gen on March the 14th in uh, Bournemouth. We couldn't. We offered it to Luke Watkins. We offered it to Dion Juma. And I'm not. It's not calling these people out saying they're, they're bum went. I'm just saying some were injured, some weren't available. Uh, Tommy McCarthy. We offered it to. Uh, who else did we offer it to? Uh, Sam Hyde. He weren't ready because he just lost in a fight. So we ran out of time to get an opponent. We we also offered it to Nathan Thorley. He wasn't ready. So we had to delay that. I put him on this show. I still want to go to Bournemouth. I'd love to go there in the summer. Beautiful place. And um, obviously that next gen was replaced with Terry Harper's next gen. So big fight for Chris Billumsmith. I really feel like the cruiserweight division is a great place to be right now. You know, you've got Lawrence Acoli about to challenge for the world title against Glowacki. You've got um, Chris Billumsmith, of course. You've got Reactpoor, British champion. 
You've got uh, Dion Juma won the final eliminator. He's due to fight Reactor next. Um, you know, really, really good times for the division. Tommy McCarthy's mandatory for the European title. So I like the division. And Billam Smith and Shane McGuigan, they're up for fighting anyone, to be honest with you. He's a good, true, solid pro. And I think he's got a lot of improvement to make. I think he's very exciting. And uh, I like him. I think he's a classy guy. And the other man I wanted to touch on was Jamie Cox. Obviously, he's yeah. been away now for over a year. He's working with Tony Borg now. A lot of people always said that they wasn't sure whether he could compete at super middleweight. We obviously saw he's lost to George Groves in World Boxing Super Series. Firstly, what way is he going to be competing at on this show? I think, again, at super middle, I mean, it's going to be difficult to come back and make 160. You know, Jamie Cox, we, we started working with Jamie Cox and everything un, unrattled real quick or evolved real quick. He boxed on a Kel Brook card at Bramall Lane. The next thing, he's boxing uh, George Groves in the Super Series. You know, he, he came back, he boxed John Ryder, he had a nightmare in that fight. And now he returns and, you know, Jamie Cox is a quality fighter. He always has been. The year out of the ring, it's going to be difficult for him to come back. He looks great. He looks re-energised. He was supposed to box previously in a six-rounder, probably about four or five months ago. So now he's, uh, he's ready to go. I'm, I'm excited. You know, I think it's exciting. He ain't really got a lot of miles on the clock, to be honest with you. And uh, he can punch. He's exciting. And we'll see what he's got left. Final thing before we do just move on is Lee Selby's fight. Obviously, you mentioned the final eliminator. Tiafimo Lopez, Vasil Lomachenko. How do you see that fight playing out first? Uh, I think it's a really good fight. I think, I think Lomachenko wins the fight. Um, I think he might be unbeatable uh, or close to. Devin Haney's got a few things to say about that. Um, but I think it's an exciting fight. And I think Lopez... Depends really what you take from the commie victory. You know, if you don't rate commie, then that victory wasn't as impressive as it might have been but if you do rate Kami and I'm one of those guys that does rate Kami I thought it was a very impressive victory I thought Tiafimo Lopez looked poor the time before that out but I thought he looked fantastic last time so I think the jury's out a little bit we know he's got ability but can he rise to beat a pound for pound great like Lomachenko you'd have to say no but maybe the kid's got it now, just to move away from this card and that fight and onto just a few things that you've just touched on earlier in the interview. You mentioned Usyk Chisora. When, when can we expect like, some type of formal announcement for everything? This week. Very soon. Very soon. Uh, you may see a press conference this week as well. Um, that fight is done. Um, I mean, it's the worst kept secret in boxing. May 23rd at the O2. Just a monstrous fight. Monstrous fight. It's one that's going to, you know, cause a huge amount of stir when it's fo finally formally announced. And as it gets closer and closer, it's going to get more and more interesting because the questions start, you know, people start doubting. We know, listen, we know Usyk, he's unbelievable. You know, undisputed cruiserweight champion of the world, great movement. But up at heavyweight, there will be questions. And there were questions even in the Chaz Witherspoon fight. So let's see him against Derek Chisora. If Derek Chisora can lean on him, slobber on him, be that big, hurtful, hungry heavyweight, I don't think this is going to be easy for Alexander Usyk. In fact, sitting there as a mandatory challenger for Anthony Joshua, I think this is an incredible ballsy fight for him to take. Because if Chisora gets through these opening rounds, he's going to be an absolute nightmare for Alexander Usyk. So I'm excited. Uh, I'm excited by the fight. And I, I think it's a real banana skin. Also, Koli Glavatsky, where can we expect an announcement there? That will be either on the uh, Chisora card or on the AJ card. At the moment, it looks like it's on the Usyk card because the WBO want us to get that fight in, in the diary. So we're speaking to the WBO uh, and also Glowacki's promotional team. I spoke to him this morning about the dates and you'll get a formal announcement on that this week as well. Cumble Fortuna? April 17. Just finalising all the paperwork for that. That April 17, like, not, not being funny, right, but the US fight fans are starting to realise what we are doing now over there in terms of the cards we're putting on. Because you look at, obviously, the Mikey Garcia card the other week. But now, again, with Pro Gray against Hooker. You know, you've got um, Campbell against Fortuna. You've got Breakhouse against McCaskill. Yesterday, we announced Hergovic against Jerry Forrest. We announced Danny Yelusinov against Julius Ndongo. Like, these, are just, they, these cards are so deep. We've been doing it over here for a long time. Obviously, we've got bigger budget in America, so we can keep going with, like, world championship fights down a card. But the zone customers, US fight fans, we're really starting to see the props now. You know, it's almost like, wow, Matchroom have done it again. You know, and um, yeah, I really feel like we're making uh, big progress over there. So which I just wanted to quickly ask you is, do you, do you understand or do you see maybe British fans' frustrations when they constantly see all these world title fights in the US 
and I don't see it over here unless it is somebody like AJ fighting at Wembley or Millennium Stadium, this case Spurs. It's just money. It's money. You know, the rights fees in America are, blimey, 10, 15 times more than the rights fees in the UK. So it's not rocket science. You've got a, uh, an amount of money to play with in a budget for a card in the UK, and you've got an amount of money to play with in a card in the US. I would love to have that budget in the UK because it gives it gives me a buzz putting those kind of cards on. You know, I don't want people to say, oh, this isn't a great card. I want people to say, like they're saying in America at the moment, fucking hell, this is unbelievable. Listen, the cards in the UK, we've come a long way. Let's not get carried away. But the only way we can make those monster cards, White Povetkin, Taylor Serrano, Callum Johnson against McAlkin, Quigley against uh, Cullen, you know, et cetera, et cetera, is on a pay-per-view model. But the difference is, and this is what I said in an interview the other day, we don't even, you look at other pay-per-views, and it's not having a pop at anyone, but Fury Wilder, uh, Joyce against Dubois, the undercards are terrible compared to our undercards. But we never really get the props, and this is not a cry for support or attention. I'm just saying, look at what we're consistently delivering. And um, the only way you can build those big cards is on pay-per-view because you have a bigger budget. You, it's really not difficult to understand. You know, it's all about the amount of budget that you have for every card. And you can only do so much with a budget. That's the Saturday night, fight night budget. That's a pay-per-view budget. And similarly, the budget for an American card as well. When we go to Italy, there's a smaller budget than the UK card. And the Italian fans will go, when are you going to put on the undercards like you do in the UK? It's all about levels. I thought he was going to put on the Italian accent, man, <laughs> Hey, the Uchiki fucker. <laughs> Just moving away, Fal. I'm very quickly on the Anthony Joshua Pulev uh, fight. Saw so, uh, Joe Goosen's announced he's going to try and cure about Pulev. What was your thoughts on that? I think it's a good move. I think, um, listen, whenever you hear that an opponent is strengthening the team, it's never great to hear. I remember when Charles, it didn't work for Charles Martin, but Charles Martin bought in um, Sugar Hill, I believe. Uh, yeah, I think it was Charles Martin. And uh, Dominic Brazil had Manny Robles, and you know you sort of thought to yourself, "Fuck, they're up for this." You know what I mean? And you listen to Bob Aram's comments as well on the SPN uh, REL show yesterday. They fancy it. They really fancy this fight. And I will tell you, we got to make sure we're switched on. AJ's got it. He's a consummate professional, but we can't afford any slip-ups in this fight. And it's going to be another one. Yeah, it seems that every fight that he goes into, apart from Ruiz one, in the last two or three years has been that pressure of, oh, you've got to win this because this is next, you know? So when he boxed uh, Molina, uh, sorry, when he boxed Molina, it was like, oh, boom, this Klitschko's next. Then he boxed Parker, oh, win this Wilder's next. You know, the Ruiz one fight was the only one where everyone was saying, when is it going to happen? Ruiz two, his career was on the line. You know, and now Pulev, oh, you've just got to win this, you've got Fury. So just, you've got, you've got to focus on the event itself and the fight itself, because in this game, it's very dangerous. My final thing, Eddie, because no press conference is about to start. You mentioned the other day at the end of the Manchester show, you had brief discussions with Aram on the back of some comments from others. How deep did those discussions go? Because once again, I'm seeing people prop up saying that you didn't have any. Because we had, I don't know, half a dozen conversations with Aram about the Pulev fight, about Fury Joshua, talking about networks, talking about where it's going to be, talking about dates, talking about step aside. No negotiations, just conversations. But I think, you know, it's pretty obvious that MTK are going to be leading all the discussions for this fight and they'll be in charge of that. And we'll continue that, and hopefully we can beat Pulev. Fury can beat uh, Wilder. and said, done deal. Well, Eddie, I'll leave you to go do your job now. Thanks, Speedsboxing Social. Cheers, Eddie.